Hello folks, welcome to Termite Woodworks. Today I'm going to be reviewing this Delta table saw that you can buy at uh, Lowe's for about 600 bucks. It is the Delta 36-725. So join me as we go over the good, the bad, and the uh, really bad. Alright, so one of the first things I want to cover is one of the good features, and that just, you know, depends on your point of view on that. But uh, for the average garage woodworker, hobbyist kind of person, you probably don't have 220 volt outlets all over your garage. This uh, table saw is 110 volts. That's actually very convenient for people that don't have like big electrical boxes. New houses these days aren't built for guys that have welders and all that kind of stuff. So that's one of the positive things and that's why I started out with this saw. The house that I was in didn't have 220. This house now does and that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of looking to upgrade into something else. But if all you have is 110, this saw will definitely get you by. Now this next item can be looked at as a, an advantage or a disadvantage. If you're just getting started into woodworking and you happen to buy this saw and you may not have an elaborate dust collection system. So this is actually an advantage for you because it's got a two and a quarter inch uh, dust collection port which hooks up to just you know about any shop vac. And you know you can get started with a hundred dollar shop vac without any big four inch hoses or anything. Now in my case I do have a four inch collection system so I just have a reducer down here to, uh, to be able to hook up to it. So for me it's actually kind of a disadvantage but if you're just getting started that's kind of the way to go. Another thing I really like about the saw is the fence system. You know it's really nice and sturdy, it moves nice and sturdy, it moves nice and smooth, it doesn't flex at all, I haven't had any problems with it flexing. Another thing I really liked about not only this uh, uh, fence but the motor I had to do no adjustments to it when I got it from the factory I checked everything out I put a dial indicator on the blade from the slots on the table everything was nice and uh, you know parallel the fence was nice and parallel it was 90 degrees to the table it does have adjustments if you need to use them but I've never actually used them and it's always been in, in, in where it's supposed to be so that's actually a pretty positive thing it came right out of the box and pretty much put power to it, checked everything, and off I went. I was using my saw. Another one of the positive aspects of this saw is the portability of it. You know, I have a small garage here. Sometimes I need to move tools around. Sometimes I like to bring a car inside. I work on the dirt bikes. And so I need something that can roll around and get out of my way. And this thing is really easy to move. You just step on the pedal and it lifts it up. And it doesn't take much effort to move it around. And when you let off on the pedal, it's actually really stable. It doesn't move around. You know, it's not really bad for such a cheap saw. The other thing I really like about it is that the roll around, uh, the uh, portability device is just part of the saw. You don't have to buy a kit. You don't have to buy anything extra. It just comes with it. So that's really nice. So the next thing I want to talk about is power. You know, the power on the saw is actually not too bad for, for its price point. It's a 13 amp saw, and if you do the math online using one of those online calculators, uh, 13 amps translates uh, at about 80% efficiency. It translates into one and three quarter horsepower. And, you know, if you want any more horsepower than that, you can't get that out of a 110 volt saw. You're going to have to step up to a 220. And I'd love to have more power, but there hasn't been any project that I couldn't get done with this saw. Now, to help it out a little bit, I did replace, I mean, everybody replaces the stock blades. The ones that come with the, the saw are junk. So I did put a thin kerf blade on it. That means the saw has to work a little bit less to power through the material. And I'm able to, to cut, take bigger cuts without stalling the saw down. It's hard to demonstrate on a video like how much power something has. I will say that I have been able to cut through two inch oak no problem. You just can't ram it through. You have to let the saw do the work. Push it through slowly and, and let it do its thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to demonstrate. I just got a piece of four by four and uh, which is three and a half inches. The saw only sticks up uh, about three inches, the blade, so it's going to completely engulf the blade. And I'm going to push it through and you can see that the saw will cut it no problem. Then I'm going to push it through fast and I can st stall the saw. Which I probably wouldn't be able to stall like a 5 horsepower saw. But for a 110 you know, volt saw, it is what it is. And 
now I'm going to push it through really hard at an unreasonable rate, something you wouldn't really normally do. And let's see if I can stall it. Well, as you can see, the motor did slow down when I pushed on it really hard, but that's not really how I work with it. I don't really want to abuse the thing. Um, and it didn't even stall it, but you could hear it, you know, laboring and slowing down. If you push your work through at a reasonable rate, there's no reason there's any project that you can't do with this saw. Now, in one arena that I have to give Delta some super high praises for this saw is the reliability factor. This saw has been perfect. It has been 100% reliable. Nothing has ever broken on it. I've owned it for about three and a half years now. Use it probably 15 days a month. It's been used and abused. I use the heck out of it and it's always held up. Never had electrical problems, motor problems. Nothing's ever fallen off of it. It's been great. So I have to give them an A plus for reliability. And now probably for the most exciting and most positive thing I see about this saw is the price point. Now I started out my woodworking with one of those little tabletop, it was a, it was a Delta, uh, I don't remember what model it was. I bought it at a pawn shop for like 50 bucks and it sat on top of my workbench and it wobbled and you know the fence wasn't straight and the table was all warped. I hated it and this thing was a huge upgrade for me. 600 bucks i was able to do a lot more work i can cut sheets of plywood on this you can't do it with those little tabletops if i had to go up back in in life to a uh, tabletop table saw i won't woodwork i'll just i'll take up bird watching or something um, but 600 dollars, it gets you a more of a real type of saw uh, my next step from here is to go to something like a cabinet saw of some sort but I'm looking at $3,000 for what I want, either a saw stop or a power, powermatic. That is a huge price jump. And if you're just getting started, $3,000 is a you know pretty big bill to stomach. $600 is more in the range of the new you know, newcomer to woodworking. And I, I still feel like I'm a newcomer. So I felt like this saw was a huge upgrade for me and I don't really regret buying it. It was a good buy, um, but now it's just time to upgrade. Now let's move on to the negatives. So remember when I said that this 110 volts was a positive? Well, it's also a negative. There's only so much horsepower that you can get out of an electric motor at 110 volts. You're limited by the amps and most, you know, uh, 110 volt circuits only allow for 15, maybe 20 amps, depends on how your house was wired. In order to get more power, you just have to step up to 220. Now I know I said that this uh, saw pretty much can do any job that I've ever wanted it to do and there's never been a project that I wasn't able to complete because of it, but at the end of the day, you want more power. More power. I want to turn my saw on and I want all the neighbor's house's lights to go dim. I want a piece of wood to break into tears when it sees the power of my saw. <laughs> Come on, be honest now. That little clip filled your heart with joy because who doesn't want a V8 powered chainsaw? And in all seriousness, you know, just having more powerful tools makes the whole experience more pleasurable. It makes it easier to work with stuff like, you know, the bigger blades, uh, like the dado blades, and even harder woods. Let's move on to the next negative item. Now, one of the pain in the butt things about this saw is the insert for the throat here. This is the one that it comes with. And as you can see, this gap here is huge. And that's a problem because for one, if you're trying to cut thinner pieces, they fall down in there, it creates a problem. And the cut that you get from this is not very clean because the fibers aren't supported on the backside. So what you're gonna want is a zero clearance uh, insert here. And they don't sell any. It's not like other popular saws where you can just go out and buy these and, you know, no big deal. You're going to have to make it yourself. And the way they designed the, uh, the opening here, it's kind of difficult to make. It's, it's, uh, it's not very easy. It's, it's not very friendly for that. There's a very thin border around the edge. I made this one out of plexiglass and some uh, plywood. And it does function. It works. And it really cleaned up the cut. 
but I had to go through the effort of making it myself, um, which a lot of people do anyway, but I'd like to be able to just go out and buy one and stick the blade through it and be done. Since we're talking about blades, here's something that I find really upsetting about this saw. Now, the blades are actually super easy to, you know, remove and replace. But one thing they didn't really put any thought into was people that want to use dado blades. So here's the problem with the dado blades. Let's say you have a big project and you have a lot of material that you need to hog out and you would like to use the full extent of your dado stack. Now I know you people in Europe, you don't use dados because it's not legal, but us Americans, we like our dados, we like our dado blades. And this saw, if you stick all of your dado blades in here, you're going to have a problem. Now as you can see here, I've put all five pieces of my dado stack in here and I haven't even included, you know, the washers that come with it, just the blades themselves. And if you look at the arbor, there's no threads showing through. So I can't actually put this nut on here. There's nothing there to, you know, screw onto. Now you could remove this washer that, you know, comes with it. But then you really don't have any stability and that's probably not a good idea. Really Delta, would it have killed you to make that arbor just a quarter inch longer? How much would that really have cost? Come on. Now while this plate is off of here and this is opened up, I want to talk a moment about dust collection. And if you look here, there's a uh, shroud that goes around the bottom of the blade here. And it tries this little hard out to suck all the uh, dust out that way to your dust collection port. Now, the problem with this is it, it only collects about 80% of the dust. There's just gaps all the way around. The cabinet is open and it just, even though a lot of this uh, dust goes into your dust collection system, and I'm going to guess about 80%, it still makes a pretty good mess on the ground. Now, I know I said that the uh, two and a quarter inch dust collection port was a positive thing, and it is for the new beginner. But it gets to a point where your dust collection system grows as you grow as a woodworker. And you're going to want a four inch hose. I want to just put this thing on here, but I can't. So I'm not getting all the benefit of my four inch dust collection hose. So to me, this is kind of a drawback. And it's time for me to step up to a bigger saw where I could take advantage of better dust collection. Now I know this is a small detail and I'm kind of nitpicking, but this is the back side of the fence. And as you can see, uh, let me go ahead and zoom it in here a little bit. The fence actually grabs onto the back rail and that's how it clamps together and is able to be, you know, pretty solid. The problem with that is unlike, you know, the Biesemeyer fences, which are free floating back here, if you want to build some sort of an outfeed table, you can't really attach it to this rail like a lot of people do because you then, how does this grip onto here? I know it's just a small little detail, but I've been wanting to build a uh, outfeed table and I never got around to it just because of this. There are other workarounds. I've seen other people do it where they attach it to the body down here, but I just didn't want to deal with that. So I've talked about a lot of details about the saw, both positive and negative, and most of the negative stuff, realistically, I could live with that stuff. It's, it's fairly minor. But this next detail I find not to be minor and it has actually caused me to hate this saw. And um, it is just something that I feel is unforgivable. And the reason for it is because as you grow as a woodworker, you want your work to get better and better. And you can only be as good as your tools. And you want to make work that is actually more and more precise. And little details that didn't used to matter are now starting to matter to you. And I feel like this saw was designed for people building houses, cutting two by fours and stuff. And I know I've made a lot of furniture out of two by fours, but I, I want to get into making more finer furniture. This saw is just not gonna do it. The precision in this saw is just not good enough to make a jewelry box or a china cabinet or something really nice. Let me show you why. My big complaint about the saw is that this table is not flat. I believe it's not cast iron. I think it's made out of butterfly wings and contact lenses. 
And the problem with it is it's like sloped inward towards the blade. And if you take a square and you put it up to the blade, it'll be square on one side. And then if you bring it in from the other, the blade appears to be tilted that way. So now it takes trickery to cut your pieces squarely. And it is a huge hassle. Um, so now you have to, if you're cutting on this side of the blade, you got to tilt it that way. If you're cutting on this side, you got to tilt it the other. I don't want to do that. I want to set it one time and be done with it. Uh, also, the table is sloping this way and that's no good because if you're trying to cut a dado as you run your piece through here your piece dips down and then when it comes out the other side it goes back up and that's causing the depth of your dado not to be consistent throughout the cut well let me show you how bad it is this is a piece of walnut that I milled on my joiner down here and this bottom edge is perfectly flat now this doesn't look like a big deal here, but if I take this shop light and put it behind it, look at the gap underneath. Now you're probably thinking, how flat is your walnut? Fair enough. Here I have a machinist straight edge. It is guaranteed flat within one thousandths from one side to the other. Let's put it on the table, use some feeler gauges, and see exactly how far off this thing is. Now I understand that if you have one to two thousandths flatness, you're doing good. So I got some feeler gauges here. And uh, just for the uh, sake of time, let's start with the ten thousandths. You probably can't read that, but it's ten thousandths. Like nothing. Here's, uh, let's see. 20 thousands probably can't read it but 20 thousands slides under there like butter uh 30 thousands no effort this is the thickest feeler gauge i have I don't know if you can see that, it's 35 thousandths. That one is barely dragging, but it does go under. You can see I can move it, and the straight edge does not move. I'm sorry, but 35 thousandths out of flat is just not acceptable to me. It makes the work too difficult. I'm tired of hunting for the perfect spot to put something so that it cuts 90. This is what's happening is um, wide pieces of board might cut at 90, but then as you get narrower pieces, like a two inch piece, as it gets close to the blade, it dips down and now you're no longer at 90. And so depending on the width of the board, you might have to change your blade angle. And then to make matters worse, it's dipped from front to rear so then as you're feeding the piece in, it goes down. I mean, it's, it's impossible really to get a perfect 90 cut. So it's impossible to make fine furniture with this piece of equipment. And that's why I'm utterly disgusted with it. If it weren't for this, I could live with all the other problems. But uh, this is something I just can't live with. And folks, that about sums it up for my review, my personal review of the Delta 36725. I hope you found this video informative. And if you had, please subscribe and maybe some other of my videos will help you in the future. And I hope that I may be able to help you uh, come to a decision whether this is a saw you might want to buy or not. Please join me on future videos and you all have a great day.